As mentioned during the last video, the use of the shearing yield strength is not limited to static service design or presetting processes calculations. Even though the shearing yield strength per se is not used in fatigue equations for springs, the initial tensile strength calculations we use for estimating the shearing yield strength still applies, which is basically the only real calculation and values lookup that we do for finding the shearing yield strength. Once we have the tensile strength, the shearing yield strength is just a percentage of that, depending on the material and if it has been preset or not. In this video, we will see how to estimate torsional endurance limits used for fatigue and we'll talk about the differences between peened and unpeened springs and how that affects fatigue equation variables. If you remember, all the SN diagram calculations for finding the number of cycles for a given stress or fatigue strength for a given number of cycles relied on having a completely reversed stress as the result of cyclic loading. The process we'll cover today is applicable to finding the equivalent completely reversed stress for a non-completely reversed fluctuating stress, which I mentioned during the last one of the fatigue videos, link below. In the following video, we will quickly mention how to check for spring buckling, which of course affects static service, and critical frequencies, which affects fatigue loading. And we will point out the intricacies of spring design and how much freedom you usually have when designing springs, regardless of if it's for fatigue or static loading applications. So let's begin with fatigue loading effects on springs. As I mentioned in the previous video, many applications where springs are used will find them subjected to cyclic or dynamic loading. Some might be subjected to a low number of cycles, like springs inside a doorknob you use a couple of times a day, but others like a valve spring in a car engine might be subjected to thousands of cycles in a minute, hundreds of thousands in a day, and many million a year. For this reason, when designing springs for fatigue loading, we aren't usually interested in knowing fatigue strengths for a given number of cycles or in finding out how many cycles a spring would last for an equivalent completely reversed stress. We usually just design for infinite life, which makes the overall calculations easier to handle. Because the best data on torsional endurance limits of steels used in springs were reported by Simmerly, some people usually refer to this analysis as using the Simmerly endurance strength. His most important contribution was realizing, after many many tests, that size, material, and tensile strength have no effect on endurance limits for sizes under 3 eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters. As explained during the first fatigue video where I used the spring example, link below, compression springs in service are usually already slightly compressed so that the reaction force is not zero, and then they are further compressed during an operation cycle. Think again of the valve spring that needs to push on the valve to close it, and as the valve opens, the spring is further compressed. For this reason, the cyclic loading is not a completely reversed stress that goes from positive to negative values hovering around zero, but from a low compression to a high compression, meaning a low shearing stress to a high shearing stress over and over. If we recall the fatigue failure criteria curves on a fluctuating stress diagram, that is, the Goodman, Gerber, Morrow, Acme curves on a Cartesian plane with alternating stresses on the y-axis and mean stresses on the x-axis, we see that a stress state, sigma a and sigma m, will be safe if it's below the criterion's curve and on the edge of failing if it's found exactly on top of the curve. Zimmerly tested unpeened springs, and we'll get to what that means in a minute, with torsional stresses in the range between 20 and 90 ksi. He found that this fluctuating stress condition was found on the boundary between finite and infinite life, which means the springs were still fine and didn't fail after 10 to the 6 cycles, which is the infinite life limit we use for all steels, since we know the steel won't fail if it already hasn't by 10 to the 6 cycles. And just like I mentioned earlier, this was true for any steel spring with a diameter under 3 eighths of an inch. This range translates into a mean shearing stress called the mean endurance strength component of 55 ksi and into the alternating shearing stress called the alternating endurance strength component of 35 ksi. The way we use these Zimmerly values depends on the failure criteria we want to use. For a Goodman criterion, if the alternating and mean stresses he used are safe, which is the same as saying that the alternating and mean endurance strength components are safe, we know that that point is located on the Goodman curve, 
If we know the equivalent property to the ultimate strength SUT, which is the x-intercept for Goodman on these fluctuating stress diagrams, we could project the line that goes from the equivalent property SUT passing through the torsional stress state to find the endurance limit. The ultimate strength equivalent for shearing stresses is called the torsional modulus of rupture, SSU, and the shearing testing of many common spring materials shows it can be estimated as 67% of the ultimate strength of the material. The graphical projection to the y-axis of a line that originates at x equal to SSU and passes through the endurance strength components location SSA and SSM can be mathematically represented by solving for SSE from the Goodman equation. Solving for SSE gives us an expression for the shearing endurance limit as a function of the similarly values, values that won't change regardless of the failure criterion we use, and the torsional modulus of rupture SSU, which is a function of SUT. And this can be done for any fatigue failure criterion. For example, the most commonly used criterion for springs is Gerber. If we know that SSA and SSM have the same values because they're always the same and we estimate SSU for any given material, we can project the curve up to the y-axis by solving for SSE from the Gerber equation. This means that the SSA and SSM similarly values are only used to find SSE. With the SSE and SSU information, you would just use whatever specific criterion's equation you're using to compare your actual shearing stress values, tau A and tau M, against SSE and SSU respectively. The alternating shearing stress tau A would be given by the spring stress equation using the alternating compressing force FA, and the mean shearing stress tau M would be given by the spring stress equation using the mean compressing force FM, where FA is the amplitude of the force and FM is the average or mean force. To improve fatigue strength of springs under dynamic loading, a process called shot peening is used. It is basically blasting the surface of the spring with small particles to create small indentations on its surface. These permanent indentations, which means plastic deformation past the yield point, will induce residual compressive stresses that are beneficial to the operation of the spring, since they will alleviate the tension on the outer surface of the spring that was induced during the winding of the wire into the shape of the spring. You can check out a one minute animation video where shot peening is very clearly illustrated in one of the links in the description of this video. The reason I mentioned unpeened springs when talking about the similarly tests earlier is because tests were also performed for the more resistant peened springs. The only difference here is that the range of stresses that were used for peened springs were of course higher, with a range from 20 to 135 ksi, still safe for infinite life. For a peened spring, you would use an SSM value of 77.5 KSI and an SSA value of 57.5 KSI to find the torsional endurance limit SSE, instead of 55 and 35 respectively. The rest of the process is exactly the same. If I have a helical compression spring made of 302 stainless steel that has a wire diameter of 83 thousandths of an inch, a mean coil diameter of 5 eighths of an inch, a free length of 4.5 inches and 15 active coils, and the spring is peened, what would the factor of safety guarding against fatigue failure using a torsional Gerber fatigue failure criterion be if the spring is going to be assembled with a preload of 18 pounds and will operate under under cyclic loading going up to a maximum load of 42 pounds. To calculate this fatigue failure factor of safety, specific for the Gerber criterion, I can look up the equation for the factor of safety and modify it in terms of the torsional or shearing properties by replacing each one of the variables. This shows me that I need to find the alternating shearing stress, the mean shearing stress, the torsional modulus of rupture, SSU, and the shearing endurance limit, SSE. And of course, I would do that also using the Gerber criterion. For the alternating shearing stress, I need to find the alternating force. And since I know that the force will go from 18 to 42, I know the amplitude, or the alternating force, will be 12 pounds. Using this value for FA and the wire diameter and the coil diameter for the curvature correction factor KB, I would find that this torsion is 24.7 KSI. For the mean shearing stress, I would need the mean or average force. 
and since nothing else changes besides the force, I know the mean shearing stress would be 30 over 12 the alternating shearing stress. Moving on to the torsional modulus of rupture, SSU, I would first need to calculate the tensile strength for 302 stainless and the wire diameter of 83 thousandths of an inch. By looking at the table, I would see that for a diameter of 84 thousandths of an inch, which is between 13 and 100 for a 302 stainless wire, the A coefficient is 169 and the exponent M is 0 0.146. Using these values, I find a tensile strength of 243 KSI, and from what we learned today, the torsional modulus of rupture would be 67% of that. Finally, to calculate the shearing endurance limit for a peen spring, where I know SSM is 77.5 KSI and SSA is 57.5 KSI, and like I said before, using the same Gerber equation to project the curve in this case, from SSU to SSE, I would find a value of 74.3. With these four values, I would be able to calculate my factor of safety. And by substituting those values in the equation, I get a factor of safety of 1.72. In the next video, we'll see that the factor of safety of 1.2 is preferred when designing springs. But of course, anything higher than that is still okay. If you want to see other examples where we use the similarly data to calculate factors of safety guarding against fatigue failure of springs, check out the links in the description below. As mentioned earlier, in the next video, we'll look at all the design restrictions, including a quick mention of buckling and critical frequencies, and it'll mostly be focused on solving a design problem where we use everything we've learned so far. Thanks for watching.